is it about success? Why do some succeed and others don't? Why does a guy like Alec Baldwin win so many awards and get, garner so much critical attention? And a guy like Chuck Norris gets no respect at all. <laughs> <laughs> and why does Martina Navratilova dominate her era of tennis? And somebody like Barbara Strykova not only gets busted for doping, but is only makes it to the ranking of 39. And why does a guy like funk legend George Clinton define an, an entire era of music, a genre of music, funk, and be such a hero to hip hop artists, et cetera? And a guy like Swamp Dog records dozens of albums but never makes it big. <laughs> well, here we are at the, something called the science of success, so isn't the basic question, why is she so successful and I'm not? <laughs> we debate this all yeah. the time. But we all come at it from different angles. A lot of what we saw that was said here, we have no idea what you people are talking about. But we are just like you in that we are incredibly curious about success. Well, maybe he's a little weirder. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm an artist, and she's a writer, and due to our great curiosity about life, we got this idea. Why don't we just go straight to some of the most successful people that we could get and simply ask them, how do you do what you do? And then we turned the idea into a book. And it was our book, so theoretically, we could do whatever we wanted as long as the publisher let us. So we said to each other, well, who do we want to interview? Well, we wanted to get people, obviously, who were very good at what they did, but being good wasn't good enough. We wanted people who not only excelled in their field, but turned it into an art form. We kind of thought of it as the Picassos and the Warhols of their given field. And we wanted people from a really wide range of human endeavor. We wanted incredible people from business like CEO of Zappos, Tony Shea, who's a Harvard grad, by the we way. We wanted elite athletes like Yogi Berra. We wanted entertainers like the rock band OK Go. We wanted scientists like the astronomer Jill Tarter. We wanted the game show geek god Ken Jennings. Great artists like the actress Laura Linney. And then, of course, we wanted a best-selling author to find out his secret, so we got Stephen Dubner of Freakonomics. And at first, our goal was to find out what was unique about all these people and really how they did what they did. We had these really in-depth conversations with people about what it was about their process that made them successful at what they did. But then... After months of research and hundreds of hours of conversation, we found out, we saw these patterns that emerged. And, and what was so interesting is it really didn't matter what people did, whether it was a rock star or a tennis champ or a CEO, these same traits kept coming up again and again. And we found these core practices and principles that they shared. So the million dollar question is, what did we find? Well, in the allotted amount of time that we've got, we will try and tell you some of what we found from our research. Well, it all begins with a dream. And a dream can be sparked by almost anything, even a toothache. So say it's 1968, and you're a French teenager, and you have an excruciating toothache, and you feel like your head is going to explode. And you're expecting the worst. Yeah, you're expecting this guy to be your dentist. So you go to the dentist's office, and what happens when you're sitting in the waiting room? While you're trying to distract yourself from the pain, you start reading a magazine, and what you see in the magazine blows your mind. Because... What, what you've seen is the inspiration for a dream. And what this French teen saw, Philippe Petit, was a rendering of the not yet constructed Twin Towers of the World Trade Building in Lower Manhattan. And the dream that was inspired was to string a wire across the void between the two buildings and walk across that. Now, 
This is the way all great achievement starts with a dream. In Petit's case, it was to walk across the World Trade Center. Somebody else might be to get tenure at Harvard, to write the great American novel. To be the biggest venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. To or... be the greatest Elvis impersonator right. ever. And when we look at people from the outside who've accomplished their dreams, we sometimes imagine them like this guy, Moses, <laughs> right? He wanted to part the Red Sea. Well, that's cool. Let me lift up my staff and shazam, it's done. But in fact, what we found is when you pursue a dream, you become its servant. Pursuing a goal is going to require more time, effort, perseverance, and disappointment than you can ever imagine. So back to Philippe Petit, obviously his dream didn't come with an instruction manual. He'd only been wire walking yeah. for six months when and he got his If idea. he had a to-do list for his dream, it would have looked like this. <laughs> we'll give a test afterwards on this. But what these people that we talked to had accomplished their dreams had was this profound commitment and a fierce dedication to engage in the everyday struggle for achievement. And then, as we all know, six years later in 1974, Philippe strung the wire across illegally and walked the wire a quarter of a mile above the pavement 200 feet across this void, while spectators gazed up in awe, and uh, they called it the artistic crime of the century. And the takeaway being that if you really want to pursue a dream, you've got to shape your life around your inspiration, not the other way around. Well, we all know the phrase, no man is an island. And once you commit to a dream, you're going to need people to help you. Anybody who has achieved, achieved great things has not done it on their own. Nearly a decade ago, Jessica Watson, um, an 11-year-old Australian girl, she got an outlandish dream. And she, based on a book that she'd read about solo circumnavigating, she decided that she wanted to do this and sail by herself around the world. But she knew that she could never make this happen without a community. And her family weren't sailors. Uh, they didn't have a lot of money. So while other kids her age would be um, you know, hanging out at the mall with their friends or going to slumber parties, she actually went out and found, built this active community. Uh, she Initially, she went to reporters at newspapers to help spread the word about her trip. Right. Through that, she found mentors. And through those mentors, she found other mentors. And there was this incredible chain reaction of people that she met that helped her. She went to marinas and boat yards and talked to sailors who helped her become seaworthy. She contacted all these circumnavigators, these veterans that had done the journey, who were very helpful to her. She, wrote, she worked on boats for free to try and get her sea legs. And even did all the work to get the corporate sponsors to bankroll this trip that actually ended up being quite expensive. So building this community, she was actually able to make this outlandish dream come true. And seven, it, she was on her seven month journey as a 16 year old. She became the youngest person to ever solo circumnavigate successfully. And she told us that this bond with this community kept her going through the incredible trials that she met when she was at sea, knockdowns and dangerous storms and heartbreaking loneliness. This, this redacted version of her community is like uh, the credits to an independent film. Right. It's, and you know, sometimes for all of us, asking for help can make us feel awkward or uncomfortable. At times, it can even make us feel ashamed. But if an 11-year-old girl can do it, why can't we? And it's something that we found with all of the people we spoke to, whether it was a, an opera star or a vintner uh, or a best-selling author, a blogger, they all needed people to help them achieve their goals. And Guy Kawasaki, we interviewed, uh, who we interviewed for our book, had a wonderful description about these 
interdependent groups that we create to help us achieve our goals. He called them ecosystems. Right. And this is a perfect example of an ecosystem right here. So one of the more surprising things that we learned talking to these people who were so hard charging and goal oriented was they were all excellent listeners. And listening, when you think about it, it's an act that puts you in a receptive state to take in knowledge. And all these people listen to learn. And what we found was they were constantly developing this sense of what they knew about the world based on this. Yeah, and one of the people we interviewed was this idealistic student teacher who walked into the classroom in her first day in Long Beach, California with a big stack of the classics, thinking she was going to teach these rough and tumble kids. In her little pearls yeah. and blue dress. She was going to yeah. be teaching them the Odyssey, and she had no idea of the mayhem that was going to occur. These kids basically treated her like a joke and turned her class into a mockery. One day when a racist cartoon was passed around, she just hit her breaking point and started yelling at the kids, challenging them, the kids, like, why are you doing what you're doing? What's going on? Now, for the first time, the kids actually began to talk. They started rolling up their pants legs and pulling up their shirts to show her all of their scars and bullet wounds. And she was, as, as she listened to them, they, she, they told her about their lives of gang-related violence and broken homes. She was shocked because she had no idea of the hardship these kids lived under. But this act of listening started her down the road of understanding these kids. Right, and she realized that in order to reach them, she was going to have to basically jettison the traditional curriculum and become a student of her students. And what she did was she transformed her teaching methods based on listening to what they had told her and brought in incredible role models for the kids to meet. She got them engaged in their communities in a way they had never been before. And she encouraged them to journal about their lives. And this act of listening actually turned into a best-selling book uh, of their journals, which is called The Freedom Writer. These, these, you know, she reached these kids so deeply who had never really been listened to by anybody that they ended up writing these incredibly moving stories. Now, Gruwell and a lot of the other people we listen practice something called active listening. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it, but, but active listening is not something passive. It requires the listener to listen to the speaker without judgment, to listen to them from their point of view, and to let the speaker know that they understand them. And Carl Rogers, who was a pioneer of active listening, could have been talking about Gruwell or any of the other people in our book when he said that listening creates much deeper and positive bonds with the people you deal with, as well as radically changing the attitudes of the listener. Now, uh, for me in school, uh, English reading and writing was always my forte. Science was like, give me a headache. Um, and the scientific method, forget it. But um, after talking to these people, these high achievers, we found that they used testing and prototyping and practicing. Simulating and modeling instead of them just assuming they knew the way things were going to turn out when they were thinking of starting a business or... Strategic changes in their companies, they were always testing. And really, testing is a way to resolve the gap between what you think will happen and what will happen. So it's, it's closing that gap and letting reality speak for itself. A really wonderful example we had of this was Bill Gross, startup king, founder of this company, Idea Lab that has created more than 100 companies. Now, back at the dawn of e-commerce in the late 90s, Bill had an idea, a hypothesis, 
that people would buy cars online. Now, Bill believed they might because he hated going to the auto mall. He hated haggling with dealers. But he was smart enough to know that the theory might be wrong. It might not work. So he devised an experiment. He and a colleague put together an online site to sell cars. Now, they did it as cheaply and quickly as possible. They didn't even have cars. There were no cars. There were no salesmen. There was no ad budget. And the morning after the site went live, Gross's colleague called up and said, hey, Bill, we sold four cars. And Bill, in a panic, said, shut the site down now. But even though they'd have to go to the auto mall. Which he hated. And buy cars and deliver to these customers, they had their results. People would and did buy cars online. And the conclusion was that Bill came to was obviously there was a market for this. So he started CarsDirect.com, which sold to internet brands, which became one of the largest internet online retailers. And obviously, had his conclusion been wrong, he could have completely abandoned the project, or he could have changed his hypothesis and, and tried something new. And you know, sometimes when we, again, when we have all these visions of what successful people are like, we assume that they're accomplishing everything based on their infallible instincts and their gut checks. But what we discovered was that all of these people really use testing to, to vet their plans. And uh, in the word of an ex-president, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> they verify, they trust, but then they verify. Uh, imagine that your day job is dealing with homicidal killers, mass deranged murders, cult leaders, and deranged right. cult leaders. And the only thing standing between these violent crazies and innocent life is you. Well, these are the conditions under which Gary Nessner, the former chief FBI hostage negotiator, spent his days. And even though his criminal counterparts had no emotional self-control, Gary told us that the most important trait for a hostage negotiator is emotional self-control. And Gary said, if someone is yelling and screaming at me and I overreact to them, how can I expect to be a positive influence? And in fact, what his job included was building empathy and rapport with the irrational hostage takers so he could help them figure out what they were feeling because that was the route to get to the ultimate goal, which was a nonviolent resolution of these conflicts. And we talked to such a wide range of people, and, and the, their emotional struggles were as varied as the people themselves. Uh, they had to learn to overcome things like fear and anxiety and disappointment and frustration, depression and envy and shame, which a lot of us can feel. And they had to do it in order to not have their actions be blocked by their emotions. They had to ask themselves, what, what am I doing today that I, is going to get in the way of my self-interest or others. So often we're overwhelmed by our emotions and, and, and we lose sight of what our goals are. And that's something that we saw with so many, again, with the people that we talked to was they found ways to either manage their emotions or in some case actually use them as motivation to move forward. As Charles Darwin said 150 years ago, in the struggle for survival, the fittest went out at the expense of their rivals because they succeed in adapting themselves best to their environment. Now, I don't know where any of you see yourself on this scale, but this quote could apply to the modern day American workforce. About 15 years ago, the chef David Chang was just getting started. And he was working in high-end restaurants in the kitchens. And he had an idea to open a noodle bar. And it was a really simple dream. He was going to 
serve a humble bowl of noodle soup with four-star technique. And he opened up a restaurant and he worked his ass off. But the restaurant was failing. And so out one night with friends at a really trendy bistro, he looked around himself and he said, we're as good as these guys. Why are we failing? He flipped out. But instead of going back and blaming the externals for his troubles. The um, economy. Right, the location staff, of the restaurant or the idiot customers. The idiot customers if they even came to the restaurant. Right. Chang went and, and underwent a brutal self-assessment. And when he, when he went through this, he went back into the kitchen with his crew. And, but and, he recognized right. that his original dream of selling a humble bowl of noodle soup was not going to be economically viable. That's right. And so he goes back into the kitchen, and he, they started cooking as if it were their last days on earth. And they started a whole new philosophy, uh, incredible culinary mashups of Asian and Mexican and Western cuisine. And what ends up happening... He first, became a foodie god. Right. I don't he know now, if any of you are familiar with him, but he's all over TV. He's got 15 restaurants, bakeries, and bars. Best-selling cookbook. And it's all because in that moment of, of doubt and pain, he questioned himself and was able to evolve. Uh, in the 1970s, a Harvard professor, Chris Argyris, I can never quite say his name right. Argyris, right. Uh, looked into why individu what individuals, individuals and organizations do when they're blocked from their goals. In other words, when they fail. And he found that what people first try to do is just ask the question, well, why did I fail? They try and figure out what went wrong. And there's two very distinct ways that people do this. The first and most common is this, the incredibly self-protective way of thinking we're all pretty familiar with more or less the blame game where you find reasons outside of yourself, technical reasons, external reasons why something failed. And the second, much less common, but much more effective way, he called double loop learning, in which everything is on the table, including our own biases and assumptions. And what we found with the people we interviewed, although I'm sure none of them have heard of double loop learning, when they encountered failure, which all of them did as everybody does in life, they had the wherewithal to really question their biases, challenge their beliefs, and the courage to act on that information. And because of that, they had the capacity to reinvent themselves and find entirely new ways of thinking about things. And the last one we're going to talk about is happiness. You know, you can't walk out your door and be in a place where there, there's pure happiness. There's no such... Bummer. <laughs> maybe Harvard Square. Yeah. There's uh, no such thing as happy land. Now, George Clinton, the legendary founder of the Funk Collectives, P-Funk, Parliament, and... Funkadelic. Funkadelic. Uh, his, his life has not been smooth going in any way, shape, or form. He's had to deal with crazy, headstrong musicians who flowed in and out of his bands. He's had to deal with record companies that reneged on contracts. He's had to deal with his publishing rights being stolen. He's had to deal with getting compensation for samples of his songs that have appeared on hundreds of hip-hop tracks. But the thing about George is that he has been, he has spanned music from doo-wop to hip-hop from his teens. He's now in, in his 70s, 70s. And he loves the struggle of trying to make great music. He told us this great thing. He said, I'm not trying to catch up with being happy. It's the pursuit of happiness I'm after. He wants to be so close behind it that he can almost touch it. And that's what keeps him looking forward to moving ahead. Now... Clinton and the other achievers, super achievers we talk to, they don't wake up in the morning and want to feel happy based on seven steps they read about in some magazine. For them, happiness is not the goal. 
but they get something much deeper by pursuing their passions. Now, we all know that pursuing ambitious goals can at times leave us lost and confused. When, you know, when you're trying to get from here all the way up to here, it can sometimes just feel like the most harrowing and lonely experience. But by pursuing a passionate life, we can find a form of happiness that is so much more rewarding and real. And once we begin to ask so much more of ourselves that we engage the world in the pursuit of our dreams, we can find a much truer form of happiness. Thank you. Something else. That was fantastic. How do we do time wise? Camille and Josh, by the way, are going to do a book reading tomorrow at 7. At 7. Right? Yeah. At, yeah. At, at the Harvard, at the Harvard group. group. Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested or if you want to send friends and people like that, since you've heard them today already. Uh, any questions? Inspirational. Um, so, yes, Laszlo, go ahead. We are all about quantification. I wonder if yeah. you all this work. Well, we, you know, we say when we talk to academics, we're, we're the poetry to your prose. Yeah. You, know? you tell us how to quantify yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, for <laughs> us, it's, it's anecdotal information. And, and, and when we began to see certain traits accrue among people, we just made an, an inference from that. But there's no way with all of the complexity, I think, that we could go in and make some actual quantification from the 36 people we interviewed. But it was interesting that talking to each one, you would get this real sense of, of what their priorities were. And uh, by the end, we just had this mass of data. I'm not so sure you could have, because there are people in this room who actually analyze text. Yeah, OK. If you were actually to look at what words you use, what is yeah. the textual characteristics uh. compared to others, you know, yeah, and also sort of a segue to this. What I kept thinking is you've, you've been talking about the common aspects of all these people. Mm. And I wonder what's different also between them because there must not be only one path to what it no, is. No, absolutely. Oh, ab absolutely. That's what exactly you, right. Absolutely, right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, for me, some of the most interesting people were, I mean, Philippe Petit and David Chang, they're, they were darker figures. And I guess maybe because I'm an artist, that appealed to me. They used, uh, to a large extent, fear and disappointment and anger were often motivations for them. So there, there was many, many differences in these people. Did you actually meet the people? Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah. He's can a funny I, guy. Can I touch yeah. him? <laughs> <laughs> you can touch him. Yeah. He's got a new book out. He's very excited. Yeah. 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 One question. Uh, so yeah, you were talking about the common aspects. But I'm pretty sure that some of those aspects are also shared by a huge amount of people who have failed and failed hard. So did you ever think of also interviewing those who have failed to try and find you know, separate what is the seat for success versus the seat for failure? Science of failure. I know. That's our next yeah. book. Yeah, right. Thank yeah, you. You, you just gave us an yeah. idea for it. You should get, I think you could get, you could get three or four people here for that <laughs> conference, the science of failure. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I mean, but, but the interesting thing, you know, that really struck us is these people failed all the time. Yeah. And they really had the wherewithal to, to move from that failure forward. And that, that, I think, in many ways was the most defining characteristic of these people. It's how they dealt with their failure that made a difference. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again very much. Okay. Oh, do you have one? One more. Uh, you know, that's what struck me. As you were talking, I was trying to listen as you said. And it, it's a little bit like life is just one big casino. And most of the time you're losing at the table. And occasionally you hit big. Yeah. But if that's the case, you have to have a big enough pocket to survive all the losses. So where did these people get the big pocket? Like, how did they get that? Uh, I mean, interestingly, yeah. they it, it, it was not... A universally wealthy group. Yeah. I mean, I would almost say, I mean, we never quantified this, but 
they were pretty, you know, some of them were wealthy, but most of them probably started from a fairly humble place. But you're talking even metaphorically, is that oh, right? Okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. Okay. <laughs> well, I hear we, casino, we, we, my, you know. we did, we thought about yeah. that. How many people were from wealthy families, how many people weren't? But uh, we, did, we have gone back. One of the things that we wished we'd done and that we, you know, maybe we'll do for an article or something is talk to some of the parents of these people. Because we did see a lot of these people who had incredible parents. They may not have had anything, but they gave these kids the, the grit and the rigor to stick with things that they had started. And I, that's my theory. I, we have a seven-year-old, so I'm kind of thinking about it She's all the time. She's our little experiment. We'll see how it works out in 30 years. Her pocket's this big so yeah. far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much again. That was yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you.